Today I'll finish up on As You Like It. I uh, probably won't try to start Twelfth Night, uh, so we'll get to Twelfth Night next next Tuesday. Uh, so uh, I was talking about As You Like It as another example of Shakespeare interrogating a literary form. In this case, the pastoral, specifically, I guess you could say the Elizabethan pastoral. And again, he's questioning this literary form and raising doubts about its effects. Uh, here's the problem with the pastoral. Uh, in many ways, it's attractive. Uh, Shakespeare's aware of how um, uh, over-sophisticated the court can be. Uh, there's uh, all sorts of gossip going on in the court, uh, people jockeying for position. There's a lot of injustice going on, and Shakespeare, who had some access to the Elizabethan court, might have indeed been witness to some of these acts. And so you can understand the attraction of going out into the countryside, leaving the court behind, getting into what we call a more natural world, a more spontaneous world, whereas we see in this play people can be honest with each other, uh, in which they can say what they mean and not be afraid of punishment. Uh, and again, Shakespeare is aware of all the limitations of the court. Certainly we saw that in the story of Prince Hal. We'll see it again in King Lear. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there's a problem with the countryside, and we see it in William. We see it in the country bumpkin. Uh, if you have never seen anything but the court, you're going to be very limited in your human development. The advantage these courtiers have is that they have been exposed to the sophistication of the court. It has its downside, but its upside as well. Uh, and so they don't come to the countryside as ignorant country bumpkins in the mold of William. Uh, and so Shakespeare's suspicious of just turning to the countryside uh, as an alternative to the court. He sees that as a kind of fantasy. Uh, and indeed, these pastorals are fantasies. Uh, they are the fantasies of hyper-sophisticated dwellers in the court who imagine that somewhere there's a simpler, uh, morally innocent, uh, less corrupt world. Uh, and Shakespeare does point out the price you would pay for that innocence is stupidity. Uh, and we see it in William, we see it in Audrey, uh, we see it in a number of these uh, 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 country characters. Uh, so Shakespeare's trying to, again, uh, deconstruct a fantasy. We hear about it on page seven in As You Like It, so that would be act one, scene one about line 111. Uh, the first time we hear of the Forest of Arden, this is the way it's described by Charles the Wrestler. Uh, 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 they say he is already in the Forest of Arden, this is the old duke, and a merry, a many merry men with him, and there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. Now there's our first clue. This is a fantasy land. It's the world of Robin Hood. They say many young gentlemen flocked up every day and fleet the time carelessly as they did in the golden world. This, as your notes point out, is the golden world of classical mythology. So it is a myth. And it's something people like to dream of. Once the world was pure, it was once uncorrupt. Uh, but, but Shakespeare has a lot of fun uh, in this play because he confronts, as he so often does, uh, a mythic dream uh, with uh, a true reality. Uh, uh, Shakespeare says, you want to go into the pastoral world, the world of shepherds and sheep? Uh, well, let's see what it would really be like. And it turns out, in this play, to be a combination of a kind of fantasy forest of Arden and a very real world of English tenant farming. This is page 34. Uh, Act two, scene four, when uh, Rosalind and Celia have arrived in the forest, they're looking for help. They're looking for food on the most basic level. And uh, they, they'd like to, as they say, they'd like to rest themselves and feed. Uh, uh, and Corinne, who is the standard wise old shepherd figure from pastoral romance, uh, has to inform her of the reality of the situation. This situation. This is line 80, so page 34, act 2, scene 4, line, line 80. My master is of a churlish disposition and little wrecks to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. 
So this isn't the dream world of pastoral romance. Uh, uh, the owner of the land uh, is not nice to people. It isn't the wonderful world of hospitality you're supposed to find uh, in, in the forest. Besides, his coat, his flocks, and bounds of feet are now on sale. <laughs> so suddenly there's commerce, there's money uh, in the world uh, of the forest. And it's very lucky that Celia and Rosalind have brought along some money with them some gold, so they actually can buy the farm in the good sense of buying the farm, because uh, otherwise they might buy the farm and starve to death. Uh, so uh, they, uh, Shakespeare reminds us that uh, this is actually a real world, and uh, it's not the dream it's cracked up to be in poetry. There are some real economic necessities. We, we saw it last time with uh, Orlando showing up with Adam, and they're nearly starving to death. Uh, uh, so Shakespeare makes us see the reality uh, of the countryside. Uh, and so the play sets up a kind of typical uh, Shakespearean dialectic in that, uh, yes, Shakespeare uses the country to criticize the court, but he also uses the court to criticize the country. Touchstone is there to make fun of these country bumpkins and expose their limited education uh, and indeed uh, their limited uh, uh, intellect. Uh, and, and so initially you might look at this play and say the pattern is to celebrate the country over the court and to embrace the natural world of the forest over the unnatural hyper-sophisticated, corrupt world of the court. But it's not as simple here. Uh, and I will say that, that uh, the, the, the direction of this play is to suggest that the state of nature for human beings is civilization. Uh, that's why the characters have to return to the court at the end. As we'll see, they've benefited a great deal from their experience in the countryside. It has in some ways rejuvenated them. It's brought their conventions, especially their love conventions, more in line with nature. But they can't stay there. <laughs> if they stay there, they risk descending to the level of Audrey and William, or at least their children <laughs> would have to grow up uh, at, at the level. There's a kind of lack of education or limited development uh, that takes place uh, in this forest world. And so I hope to have time to talk about that either today or when we get to King Lear, this political issue of the state of nature. I'll just say that on, on this issue, I believe Shakespeare sides with the ancients against the moderns. He sides especially, I think, with Aristotle against Thomas Hobbes and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Again, I may get a, I hope to get a chance to uh, elaborate it. But, you know, the question is, when are human beings most human beings? Uh, and in modern political philosophy, the tendency is to look at the stripped-down version, look at the lowest common denominator, what's the very least someone can be, and you can still call that person a human being. And uh, Hobbes and uh, Rousseau uh, look into that. Rousseau even claims that a, a truly natural man would not have speech or reason. Uh, Shakespeare takes the view that to understand a thing, you want to see its perfection, its highest version. You want to see what it aims at. This is a very Aristotelian view. But let me use Jane Austen to illustrate the point. Jane Austen, whom I feel is the most Shakespearean of English novelists. Uh, this is a passage from Emma, her novel Emma, book three, chapter six. And it's a the conversation between Emma and her ultimate husband, Mr. Knightley, uh, and they're planning a country party. Uh, and it's funny how it uh, uh, recovers the ground of as you like it here. Uh, 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 Emma wants what she calls a gypsy party. There is to be no form or parade, a sort of gypsy party. We are to walk about your gardens and gather the strawberries ourselves and sit under trees. It is to be all out of doors, everything as natural and simple as possible. So that's Emma's view. The, the natural and the simple is out of doors, and there's no form, and we just wander around. Everything as natural and simple as possible. Is not that your idea, she says to Mr. Knightley, and he answers, not quite. 
my idea of the simple and the natural will be to have the table spread in the dining room. The nature and simplicity of gentlemen and ladies, with their servants and furniture, I think is best observed by meals within doors. When you are tired of eating strawberries, uh, there shall be cold meat in the house. Uh, now this is, uh, Jane Austen is a very profound author, uh, and she or she reveals her Aristotelianism. Uh, the nature and simplicity of gentlemen and ladies uh, is best observed by meals within doors. This is that Aristotelian, I'm saying also the Shakespearean perspective, that if you want to understand human beings, you have to find them in their most civilized form, in the most refined form. Uh, and uh, this is so counter to uh, our views today. It's so counter to the views of the English romantics writing in, uh, uh, around the same time uh, in England, especially the idea that, that here that, that uh, nightly parenthetically remarks that to understand the nature and simplicity of gentlemen and ladies, you have to see them with their servants and furniture. You can't strip them down to the bare minimum. You want to see them as fully developed, and that means as elegant uh, as possible, as, as decked out, as, as dressed up. Anyway, it's a fascinating passage. Uh, I think it shows how uh, uh, philosophical Jane Austen was as well. And I wish I could give a course on the politics of Jane Austen as well. So this is something we'll be exploring when we get to King Lear, uh, where the question is posed so fundamentally uh, is, uh, is man most man in his nakedness or in his clothing? Uh, I bring this up now because Shakespeare is going to be pursuing it uh, in even greater and tragic depth than King Lear. Now, uh, as I was saying at the end of last lecture, uh, this is all related to the question of love. The larger question is uh, uh, how do you define human nature, how do you understand human nature? Uh, uh, for Shakespeare, you look at human beings in civilization, and that means with all their furniture, with all their conventions, all the complicated things that make us civilized. And Shakespeare sees something related uh, in the treatment of love. And so in, in love, the question is, what is true love? Is it love reduced to the physiological, to the barest essentials, to two naked animals copulating? That is, we saw Touchstone's vision of love. Touchstone is a reductionist. Uh, he's a materialist. If you turn to page 31, uh, this is Act uh, 2, Scene 4, uh, very beginning, line 1. Rosalind, as they're coming through the, to the forest garden, says, O Jupiter, how weary are my spirits. And Touchstone says, I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. He doesn't care about the spirit, about the soul. He's only worried about the body. And that manifests itself in love. Uh, as we saw, uh, for him, love is rutting. It's the mating season. He's in a forest. There's this woman there, Audrey. She's not particularly attractive. Uh, he really doesn't care much about her, but he wants to have sex with her. Uh, uh, and, and as he finally says, Audrey, we must be married or else be, live in Baudry. Uh The only reason he wants to get married is to be able to have sex uh, with this woman. And that's funny and uh, it helps to cut down the pretensions uh, of the over-idealized lovers in the play, uh, but it, I don't believe it's Shakespeare's answer. Indeed, I think Shakespeare, as he so often does, carefully sets up an opposition here to define uh, what we could call an Aristotelian middle or, may, or the Gold Goldilocks solution. Uh, or, uh, Touchstone and Audrey are too physical about love, uh, Sylvia's and Phoebe are not physical enough. For them, love is all poetry. For Touchstone and Audrey, it's all prose. And I'm going to offer uh, Rosalind and, Gan uh, and uh, uh, Orlando as the happy medium between these two extremes. A love that is physical, it's rooted in the body, will lead to uh, family and generation, uh, but at the same time has a spiritual component, 
does involve refinement uh, and is not simply a matter of physical sex. Uh, uh, in contrast to Sylvia's and Phoebe, where if they stayed the way they were at the beginning of the play, there'd be no sexual consummation whatsoever. So I'll quickly go through, I went through, touched on Audrey last time, talk about Sylvia's and Phoebe this time, and then uh, spend most of today talking about the relationship between Rosalind uh, and uh, Orlando. Uh, I did have the benefit of reading As You Like It before I taught the course, and so I will say a lot of my discussion of Romeo and Juliet and Ms. Sunrise Dream was guided by this play. I think this is Shakespeare's most thoroughgoing examination of the problem of romantic love and his most thoroughgoing critique of the Petrarchan understanding of love, and as I say, it, 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 it colored my interpretation uh, of the last two plays. Uh, so now let's look at, at, at Sylvius uh, and Phoebe. Uh, uh, now, the pastoral, uh, especially as it developed uh, in the Renaissance Italy and then in Renaissance England, uh, had a strong component of Petrarchanism in it, in that very often you would come to the forest and you'd find a shepherd and a shepherdess in love, and it was very much expressed in terms of uh, Petrarchan love language. And so if you turn to page 32, this is Act 2, Scene 4, uh, about line 23, uh, we immediately see the marks of the Petrarchan lover in Sylvius. Indeed, he sounds just like Romeo. This is line 23. No, Corinne, being old, thou canst not guess, though in thy youth thou wast as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? So again, all those attitudes that we saw in Romeo, Older people can't understand love. You have to be lo young to understand love. And in any case, nobody can understand love better than I can. Nobody has ever experienced a love by it like mine. Uh, this incredible pretension to uniqueness on the part of the young lover. Now, in Romeo's case, it was justified, though only by his death, by his proving willing uh, to die for this. Uh, so what we see here... Uh, is something <laughs> deeply poetic in that Sylvius has gotten his idea of love from poetry. Uh, he's off in the forest, and yet he's gotten his ideas of love from courtly love. Uh, it's very interesting that our language calls the wooing uh, of a man and woman courtship. I checked the etymology uh, this afternoon, and indeed it comes from the court. Uh, this is what I've been calling trickle-down romanticism, uh, that ordinary people get their idea of love from the court. You know, to, today it's like watching movie stars uh, uh, and taking our patterns of love from various media. Uh, and in this case, you know, it's I don't know if this is true in other languages, uh, but there is this idea in our very word courtship. We don't call it countryship, notice. Uh, we don't get our idea of love from the country. Uh, uh, that would be very different. Country matters, as Hamlet calls them. Uh, but uh, uh, here, uh, courtship. Uh, who, what is... What is this doing in the forest of Ar Arden? Why is this jerk Sylvius behaving like he's coming out of Romeo and Juliet? And we see the problem on page 67. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is Act 3, Scene 5. Uh, very beginning line one. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humble neck, but beg, first begs pardon. Will you stern a bee that he that dies and lives by bloody drops? Now, he's basically asking her to reject it. Uh, say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. You know... Uh, what woman wouldn't take advantage of this situation when this jerk is standing around here saying, oh, reject me, but, but be nice about it? Uh, uh, he's playing a part here. This is what he's read about, that uh, 
The true lover has a disdainful mistress. She considers herself above him, uh, and he has to suffer uh, to prove his love. Uh, uh, in many ways, this is a bad attitude, but it's also a pose, and it's also become a habit. Presumably does this every day. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Phoebe, uh, what, what uh, incentive does she have to move beyond uh, uh, this stage? Now, there's one hopeful sign uh, in that even at this moment, Phoebe is prepared to say to him, now will you just cut this romantic crap? I, I've had enough of your poetry. This is page 68. So act three, scene five, line uh, uh, 19. She, she's basically saying, let's get real here uh, and get rid of this poetry. Lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wound mine eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rush, the cicatrix and capable and pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted thee, hurt thee not. Nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Uh, uh, now, it was one of the great uh, tropes of Petrarchan love poetry that uh, the, the uh, beloved's eyes slay the lover. Your eyes slay me. They murder me uh, with their beaming power. And he's saying eyes. She's saying eyes. Eyes can't hurt anybody. Uh, 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 she's trying to remind him, you know, th this is all poetry you're spouting uh, at me. And that's why it's staying at the level of poetry. Uh, in a way, she's saying, get real here. And that's the problem. Now, fortunately, Rosalind is there in her disguise as Ganymede. Uh, 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 she is going to set in motion a series of events that will break Sylvius and Phoebe out of this impasse. Uh, they've reached a dead end, uh, and they need to be broken out of these stereotypes they're adopting. Now, temporarily, uh, it's unfortunate because uh, uh, Phoebe falls in love with what she thinks is a young boy, Ganymede. Uh, and indeed, this is page 69. Uh, 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 so still act three, scene five, line 40. Uh, in the midst of talking, Rosalind notices something. Uh, of Phoebe, why do you look on me? Uh, uh, I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's cell work. Odds my little life. I think she means to tangle my eyes too. So she notices that uh, uh, Phoebe is eyeing Ganymede and falling in love with him. Now, you see, you know, Phoebe has been playing this disdainful mistress, I'm above love, uh, I will give myself to no man. And then one apparently handsome boy shows up, and suddenly uh, she's giving him uh, uh, the look, the come on look. Uh, and Rosalind tries to intervene here uh, and explain things uh, uh, to Phoebe. This is still page 69, about line uh, uh, 46. "'Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entain my spirits to your worship." Now, you may recognize by now, that's, again, the language out of Petrarchan love poetry. Uh, the, the beautiful woman always has uh, uh, silk hair. She has cheek of cream here. Uh, uh, and... and uh, uh, Rosalind as Ganymede is cautioning her, you foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her? Now she's addressing uh, Silvius. Why do you follow her like foggy south, puffing wind, wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that makes the world full of ill-favored children. Tis not a glass, but you that flatters her. <laughs> and trying to tell you, she's not all that good looking. <laughs> Why are you wasting your time on her? Uh, and out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show, show her. You're, you're basically puffing up her vanity with all this attention. But mistress, and now very Socratic, but mistress, know yourself. The great Socratic injunction, uh, know thyself. Uh, 
uh, uh, you, Phoebe, you better wake up to the reality of the situation. But mistress, know yourself down on your knees and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy, love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So take he, her to thee, shepherd, fare you well. Uh, so here's an important moment Typical of the action throughout uh, this, the middle of this play, Phoebe should get down on her knees. Reverse the typical situation. The typical situation in this Petrarchan love is the man on his knees, bowing down, worshiping the woman, putting her on her pedestal, looking up at her. Uh, and and <laughs> Rosalind, a woman, uh, says, we got to get out of this rut, and the way to do it is shake things up, turn things upside down. You, sh you, you woman, Phoebe, you should be worshiping him. He's actually better looking as a man than you are as a woman. And in any case, this is as good as you're going to do. Uh, now that's, <laughs> uh, that will turn out to be the solution. Sylvius and Phoebe are suited to each other. The problem is, in a way, they're too suited to each other. Uh, from Phoebe's point of view, Sylvius is the boy next door. He's right for her. Uh, he probably is the best mate she's ever going to find. Uh, uh, but she, she won't accept that. She wants something more exotic. And so the first stranger that comes along, she falls in love with, uh, namely Ganymede. Uh, uh, and indeed... Uh, it's actually uh, page 70. Rosalind, uh, again, as Ganymede points out, line 72, I pray you do not fall in love with me. But this is the crazy world of Eros for Shakespeare. So indeed, people always seek out what they can't have, what seems improbable, what's strange, what's exotic, anything other than what's logical. Uh, uh, and so we get an absolutely fascinating moment on page 70, line 81, when Phoebe says, Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of might, whoever loved that loved not at first sight. And that's a quotation from Christopher Marlowe. Uh, as your notes point out, it's from Marlowe's poem, uh, Hero and Leander, which had come out in 1598, so very close to the date when this play uh, would have been coming out. And here is the most self-conscious moment we've seen uh, uh, so far. We saw Mercutio refer to Petrarch uh, in Romeo and Juliet. Here Shakespeare actually quotes one of these um, mainline uh, romantic poems, the story of Hero and Leander, which we saw made fun of in Midsummer Night's Dream uh, in the play that the Rude Mechanicals came up with. And of course, it is the absolutely central conceit of Petrarch and love, Love at first sight, the thing we saw with Romeo and Juliet, we'll see it again in this play, but whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Very famous lines, often quoted. Uh, it does come from Christopher Marlowe. But this is kind of amazing when you think about it. Uh, this shepherd has been reading Christopher Marlowe's poetry in the middle of the forest. Uh, and that, that's my trickle-down romanticism for you, that, that yes, they're off in the countryside, but they're still, uh, where are they getting their ideas of love? Uh, are they observing the barnyard animals, which would teach them some very basic facts of life? No, they're reading the poetry of Christopher Marlowe, and Hero and Leander had a tragic love. Uh, Leander drowned trying to cross the Hellespont uh, to get to Hero. Hero was a woman, by the way. Uh, uh, and and uh, we'll see Rosalind make fun of this in a moment. Uh, so it, it's, it's quite fascinating that Shakespeare uh, brings, actually quote Christopher Marlowe in the play. This is our Don Quixote moment. This is our uh, uh, life-imitating art moment. Uh, really see here the derivation of the ideas of love are not spontaneous, uh, they're, they're mediated, mediated by literature here. Uh, supposed to be in this world of the countryside, spontaneous, unmediated. Instead, we see they're, they're, they're 
checking for the latest uh, version of love uh, in Christopher uh, uh, Marlowe here. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'm going to skip a lot here. Uh, we'll come back when we look at Rosalind Ganymede. But basically, what we see here is that Rosalind sets in motion a whole series of plots that resolves all the love imp impasses in the play. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, she feels she has to teach uh, Phoebe a lesson here. Phoebe needs to learn what it is to be despised and rejected by a lover. She has been playing this role towards Silvius uh, and enjoying every minute of it, seeing him grovel. Uh, but she's got to learn what it is to grovel. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, Rosalind as Ganymede sets things up so that Phoebe experiences an unrequited love. Uh, uh, and by the end of the play, uh, she will be ready for what she was not willing to accept at the beginning of the play. She was not willing to accept uh, Silvius as a lover, no matter how logical that union was. But at the end of the play, when everyone's getting lined up for marriage, uh, she's offered the possibility of marrying a woman. Uh, she was in love with Ganymede. When she finds out Ganymede uh, 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 is a woman, she's not willing uh, to marry her. Uh, it's unlike what happens at the end of uh, uh, Some Like It Hot. This is page 102, uh, Act 5, Scene 4, about line 149. She says to Philbius, uh, Silvius, I will not eat my word, now thou art mine. Thy faith, my fancy to thee, doth combine. And there it is. She discovers the value of having a man who loves her. And it trumps a lot of other considerations. Uh, it trumps the fact that he's the boy next door. It trumps the fact that maybe he's not the handsomest guy uh, in England uh, or France or wherever, but... But, but, you know, she realizes the value of having a man who's genuinely devoted to her. She wasn't able to understand that at the beginning of the play. I think it was very important that Orlando, uh, that uh, Rosalind teaches her that. And in general, that's what's going on in this play. People have to be shaken out of false conventional attitudes towards love to fight their way through to some kind of reasonable union. And the main story of that, which I'll now dwell on uh, for much of the rest of today, is the story of uh, Rosalind uh, and uh, Orlando. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> they're in a rather unusual romantic situation. They meet at a wrestling match. Uh, <laughs> And I think in this way is real key to what's going on here. It's a reminder that love is something physical. Uh, I, I assume that uh, Orlando strips down, takes off his shirt for the wrestling match. And uh, a lot of producers do this way, do it this way. It's very effective. You realize what attracts Rosalind to Orlando. He's a hunk. Uh, she, uh, uh, she sees him at his most physical. Uh, 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 namely, you know, stripped down and also uh, winning a wrestling match against a champion uh, makes him very attractive to her. And so we do get a kind of love at first sight here. Uh, she falls in love uh, at or 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 Orlando in his wrestling trunks and he falls in love with her. But something very strange happens compared to Romeo and Juliet. Remember, Romeo and Juliet met in a sonnet. Their first words to each other were fully articul articulated back and forth, Shakespearean sonnet. That gets short-circuited here. This is page 17. Uh, uh, so act one, scene two, line 235. Rosalind makes the first move. And this already tells us something about Rosalind. Uh, that she is going to be a different kind of woman, a different kind of romantic heroine here. She is not going to sit back and let love unfold according to its Petrarchan course. Uh, so she decides to reward him. Line two thirds for a gentleman gives to uh, wear this for me, one out of suits with fortune that could give more, but that her hand lacks means. Now that's a pretty good. Come on, line there. Uh, <laughs> she's facing. Uh, 
uh, here's the chain. I could give you more. I mean, how much more can she say? This is very forward, uh, uh, perhaps even by standard today, but certainly by the standards of Shakespeare's day, and certainly by the standards of Petrarchan love. The woman does not make the first move. She sits in the castle uh, and waits for the serenade from the lover. Uh, and she's waiting. She's made the first move. But now she's waiting for the comeback. Uh, and so, shall we go, cuz? Aye, fare you well, fair gentleman. And Orlando, you got a picture, is there saying, humana, 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 humana. can I not say I thank you? My better parts are all thrown down, and that which here stands up is but a quintin, a mere lifeless block. He can't say anything to her. He freezes in this situation. Uh, <laughs> Rosalind comes back. You, 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 there are no stage directions here, but you have to see how this is, uh, would be staged. He calls us back. My pride fell with my fortunes. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Sir, you have wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemies. I mean, how much clearer can she be? Will you go, cuz? Have with you, fare you well. And Orlando just stands there. What? Passion hangs these weights upon my tongue. I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference. O oh, poor Orlando, thou art overthrown. Here we see the complete failure of the lover. He is at a loss for words at this moment. He has no pickup lines. He can't say to her, oh, you do teach the torches to burn bright. Uh, uh, Shakespeare must have had the greatest pickup lines in Elizabethan England. Uh, uh, and it, no, he can't say anything. Uh, and this, is, this problem of inarticulateness is really uh, the same as uh, William. This, this, uh, Orlando's like William here. How are you doing? So, so. Uh, it's all he can come up with. He, uh, he's lacking in what you need to be a lover. Uh, it's true that we see in the case of Phoebe and Silvius that love language can be phony, it can be just a bunch of words, and it can't stay just at the level of words, but it has to begin with words. Uh, there has to be some kind of conversation. And Orlando's failure to love, as a lover here uh, is a failure uh, of, of language. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a very disappointing moment compared to Romeo and Juliet. They, they jumpstart their love with a sonnet. Uh, here we see a frustrated love because Orlando has no words at his disposal. Uh, uh, and we see... Just the opposite on page 47. Uh, Act 3, scene 2, line 1. Suddenly, the guy's got poetry. Hang there my verse and witness of my love, and thou, thrice-crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that might for life to sway. Oh, Rosaline, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts are character, that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, and unexpressive she. Now, where was this poetry when he needed it? At the wrestling match. Uh, it's almost a sonnet. Uh, 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 this is what he needed, uh, some beautiful language uh, to respond to her overtures. But there's a problem here. It's, in a way, the opposite problem. Uh, in the first act, he had no words. Now he has too many, and they're on a paper, and he's putting them on trees. <laughs> he's putting up, he's posting poems to, to, to Rosalind all over the forest, making a fool of himself, uh, as Touchstone uh, sees it. And uh, in a way, this is no more adequate than the uh, wordlessness of Act One, because there's no act of communication taking place. Remember, Romeo and Juliet meet in a sonnet. They talk back and forth in sonnet form. This is, as I say, almost sonnet form. Uh, but it's, it's like dead letters. Uh, he's not presenting them to Rosaline. He's posting them up on trees. These trees shall be my books. It's as if he's reducing the world of nature to the world of uh, a convention here. Uh, 
So uh, he either has too little poetry or too much. Uh, he cannot get the middle ground here. Uh, and so, so uh, uh, Rosalind is going to have to teach him. Uh, uh, she's going to have to uh, uh, make him into the proper lover. And that will involve teaching him the language of love. And fortunately, she's in the position to do it. And this is something new for us in the course, uh, and a real transformation. Uh, one of the lovers is going to solve the problem herself. Uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream, we saw the solution come from these mysterious forces in nature. Uh, left to themselves, Hermia, Helena, Demetrius, and Lysander could not solve their problems. Uh, and this looks like it could be a similar situation, but no, Rosalind is a very unusual character, uh, 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 and, and uh, one of many uh, uh, female romantic heroines in, in, in Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, she will take the initiative, and she will solve the problem. Uh, and one reason she's able to do it is that she is freer, not quite free of all convention, but freer convention than the other characters, and especially uh, uh, Orlando. Uh, Orlando has a lot of problems in a romantic situation. He doesn't know how to talk to a woman. As we see, he freezes up. And it's probably because he has these conceptions of what a woman is like. And he's a little uh, thrown off when this woman comes on to him. That's not what's supposed to happen, and he doesn't know how to react to it. By the same time, we see, we, same time we see that uh, Rosalind is not so bound by convention. She's willing to do the unconventional thing and seize the initiative in love uh, in order to get things moving when she sees a handsome uh, young man. Uh, and it turns out, in general, she's playful, and she knows how to act. Uh, look at page 10. Uh, this is very early in the play, Act 1, Scene 2, about line 24. Uh, uh, from henceforth, I will cause, and devise sports. From the very beginning of the play, she wants to devise sports. Let me see what think you of falling in love. And it's very important that she sees falling in love as a sport, a game, because then she can be playful about it. Uh, We've seen up to now, all these young lovers, they take love so seriously, uh, deadly seriously in the case of Romeo and Juliet. It's so why they have problems handling it, because they're so serious about it. It's going to be very important that uh, 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 Rosalind uh, uh, will think of falling in love as a sport, or later, page 67, so this is Act 3, Scene 5, uh, excuse me, Act 3, Scene 4, the very end, line 56, I'll prove a busy actor in their play. There's something puckish about Rosalind. Uh, she behaves a bit like Puck in the sense that she feels detached from the action. She can take, uh, uh, like Tom Brady, she can see the whole field in front of her and see how everything's shaping up. And, and where to attack, and so on. Uh, how to pick apart the defense. Uh, she, uh, uh, again, it's like Puck. I'll, I'll take care of this. I can maneuver these people. I'll act in their play. They'll be taking it seriously, but I'll act in it, uh, and I'll solve things. And that's the whole f function of the middle of one of these Shakespearean comedies. Uh, it is a play space. Uh, uh, the, the characters get to act out in a safe environment some very serious stuff in preparation of getting their lives in order. Uh, and, and Rosalind has already understood this. There's a real problem with this Orlando guy. <laughs> He's a hunk. <laughs> I, I want to marry him. Uh, 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 but but uh, he couldn't even talk to me when I came on to him. How in the world is this guy ever going to propose to me? How is he ever going to find the words to say, will you marry me? And so she realizes she's got to put him through his paces. And what we get in the Forest of Arden is an exhibition game. It's not the Super Bowl. Uh, Orlando freezes in the Super Bowl. Uh, 
uh, when he thinks he's dealing with a real romantic situation, he just can't do a thing. Uh, so he's going to have to have an exhibition game here and learn the moves when he thinks nothing real is at stake. Uh, and so uh, we've got Ganymede here, becomes his friend. Uh, and of course now Shakespeare's playing with one of the conventions of his theater here. As you may know, uh, women were not allowed to act on the Elizabethan stage, and so uh, all the female parts were played by boys. Uh, they must have been extraordinary uh, good actors because Shakespeare wrote parts for them like Lady Macbeth uh, and Cleopatra that shows how versatile uh, these boys must have been. And uh, it seems strange to us, but if you look at some of uh, our movie stars, someone like Leonardo DiCaprio, when he was in, in his early teens, uh, was already a great actor and could easily have played uh, a woman. Uh, he was so beautiful. Uh, and there were many examples of that. There must have been such uh, boys in uh, uh, Shakespeare's day, and uh, 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 it functioned uh, fine in the theater. Uh, Shakespeare did seem to like the pattern of having a boy play a woman in a part in which the woman then dressed up as a boy. It happens in several of his plays. You'll see it in Twelfth Night, it happens in Merchant of Venice. Uh, in some ways it made it easier for the boy playing a part to be dressed as a boy and to kind of behave like a boy uh, in his body movement uh, uh, for much of the play. Uh, but in any case, Shakespeare, I mean, I think he uses it for uh, dramatic purposes, but also it really becomes thematic in the plays. That uh, what's key here is that people have to get out of the rut of their normal social roles. Uh, they've gotten into habits, they've gotten into impasses, uh, they need to break out of them, and one of them is just to turn things upside down. We've seen this again and again, the function of wearing masks in Romeo and Juliet, the whole topsy-turviness of the middle of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Shakespeare says, yeah, in an impasse in love, let's shake things up and see how they fall out. Uh, and, and maybe indeed uh, uh, they will uh, get better. And it's particularly true here. We see how sexual, the normal sexual roles uh, can interfere with communication because there are certain expectations of how a man will behave, there are certain expectations of how a woman will behave. Uh, these expectations were stronger and more limited in Shakespeare's day uh, than in our own, but we still have them. Uh, and so the point is, dress uh, Rosalind up as Ganymede, uh, and she can behave differently. Uh, and indeed, it's quite interesting what Shakespeare does here. We'll see this uh, uh, more thoroughly in Twelfth Night, but basically he's thinking of remodeling romantic love uh, on the model of friendship. That uh, it turns out that Rosalind and Orlando can get to know each other better if the sexual component is bracketed out initially if they're not there as man and woman worried about all those issues between man and woman, uh, if they can just, as we would say, be friends, if they can talk man to man, or boy to man, as it is in this case. Uh, see how this works out even more fully uh, uh, in Twelfth Night. We have seen this at several points uh, in Shakespeare, uh, the, the really deep bond of friendship that he portrays between members of the same sex. Uh, we saw it uh, in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, where uh, Helena speaks of how, how much friends she was with uh, Hermia when they went to school together, and how they were like uh, mirror images of each other, and they were like one. Now we see that with Celia, uh, and uh, uh, Rosalind in this play, uh, you, uh, 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 they grew up together and they love each other and they trust each other and they're completely open and free with each other. Think back to Romeo and Juliet and the kind of male bonding there. These young men who, who kind of gang together. Uh, 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 Male-female relations are complicated by the sexual component and especially when uh, things are governed by the aim of marriage. Uh, you can't be quite 
completely open with people, uh, w with the person with whom you may be married. You're, you're suspicious. Remember how Juliet is upset that Romeo overheard her love for her, and now she wonders, how will I ever find out if he really loves me? Uh, a lot of Shakespeare is built on what we, uh, the battle between the sexes, uh, the suspicions one sex has of the other, and so on. Uh, and he often juxtaposes this. Uh, Merchant of Venice is another example with, with uh, very uh, uh, highly idealized friendships uh, where two women or two men share everything and have no secrets from each other. Uh, again, we'll see this in Twelfth Night. Uh, and here in As You Like It, the sense is that uh, uh, as long as Orlando is meaning Ganymede, he can become friends with this other person without worrying how it affects <laughs> his marital future. Uh, uh, and so there's all sorts of components going on here. Just the sheer business of freeing people from their normal roles, the inversions of the sexual identity, the creation of a friendship as the prelude to romantic love. Uh, again, you can, so much of the Petrarchan apparatus prevents the man and woman from becoming friends because it's such a long distance thing. Uh, and again, when Silvius just comes out saying, Go ahead, reject me. Uh, not the basis for long-term friendship. Uh, and, the, and Phoebe playing this disdainful remote mistress at the same time. Uh, uh, what, what is so striking is the ease with which Orlando can talk to Ganymede when he was tongue-tied when confronted with the same being except as Rosalind. And notice they talk in prose. Uh, 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 this play attempts to create the prose of romantic love. We've had so much poetry of romantic love. Uh, uh, this play suggests the, the negotiation of romantic love could take place much more easily in prose. Again, there's a marvelous Jane Austen moment I feel I have to share with you. This is from her novel, Persuasion. Uh, uh, where uh, the heroine, Anne Elliot, criticizes a certain Captain Benwick because he's been reading too much romantic poetry, too much Lord Byron and, and Walter Scott. Uh, uh, and Austen writes, he repeated with such tremulous feeling the various lines which imaged a broken heart or a mind destroyed by wretchedness that Anne ventured to hope he did not always read only poetry she ventured to recommend a larger allowance of prose in his daily study. Uh, Anne Elliot was very much like Rosalind in that respect, and it's one of the great aspects of this play, how it balances uh, poetry uh, with prose, and, and the real business of love takes place in prose. Uh, so let me take you through Rosalind's education of Orlando, uh, and let's start page... Uh, 59, uh, so uh, this is uh, Act 3, Scene 2, about line 366. Uh, she decides to explain to him what she thinks a lover should look like, and it turns out to be point for point against the Petrarchan model. Uh, Orlando, line 365, asks, what were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not, Again, the lover's always pining away in Petrarch's poetry. He's pale, uh, uh, a blue eye and sunken, which you have not, an unquestionable spirit, which you have not, a beard neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, for simply your having a beard is a young and bloated's revenue. Then your hose should be unguarded, uh, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned. By the way, this is exactly the way Hamlet appears to Ophelia when he's trying to convince her that uh, he's in love with her. Uh, your shoe untied and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you were no such man. You were rather point to vice in your accoutrements as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. She wants a man who loves himself, who has some respect for himself, who dresses well, who keeps his appearance up. She doesn't want one, one of these moping, whining, Petrarchan lovers who proves his romantic virtue by how miserable he looks. Uh, 
She met him at a wrestling match. <laughs> and, she, and she doesn't want a guy who's wasting away because he's pining away. She wants a virile uh, man, and that's why she's chosen uh, Orlando. And she's trying to give him a hint that he's okay. Uh, and then she starts rehearsing him uh, for the key stuff here. This is page uh, uh, 75. Um, uh, uh, so Act 4, Scene 4, uh, Act 4, Scene 1, about line uh, 64. She says, let me pretend to be your Rosaline. Now, of course, she is Rosaline. Uh, and so we get this incredible complication here. We now have a boy playing a female character who masquerades as a boy who will now play a female character. Uh, it's vertiginous, as we say in literary criticism. And indeed, there's nothing in postmodern literature that's more complex uh, than this. Uh, uh, and, and so, page 75, uh, at 4 scene 1, line 64, Come woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now? And I worry you a very, very Rosaline. Uh, uh, and they banter about uh, here. Uh, and finally, uh, this next page, page 76, line 87 in the scene, uh, 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 is, uh, uh, when she seems to be rejecting him, he says, then in mine own person I die. And there it is again. Uh, the cornerstone of Petrarchan love poetry, dying for your beloved. And Rosalind says, no. Faith, die by eternity. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time there was not any man died in his own person, that is, in a love cause. Troilus had his brains dashed out with the Grecian club, yet he did what he could to die before, and he is one of the patterns of love. Leander, now here's her comment on Phoebe's quotation of Marlowe. Leander, he would have been, he would have lived many a fair year, though hero had turned none, if it had not been for a midsummer night, for good youth he went but forth to wash him in the Hellespont, and being taken with the cramp was drowned. Now the deconstruction for myth. Leander didn't die trying to swim the Hellespont to get the hero. Uh, he had a cramp and drowned, uh, and being taken with the cramp was drowned, and the foolish chroniclers of the age found it was hero of Sestos. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, not for love. That's an amazing claim in a play about romantic love. Uh, but it is the ultimate deconstruction of the ultimate myth of romantic love, the most dangerous part of the myth. This thing that we saw took Romeo and Juliet to their deaths. The notion it ain't love if you're not dying for it. Very much in prose, Rosalind says, men have died from time to time and words we them, but not for love. Now, you may remember the exact same moment in Henry V. Uh, in Act 5, Scene 2, page 119, when wooing Catherine, uh, uh, he woos her in prose, uh, uh, and he says, I speak to thee, plain soldier, if thou canst love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true. But for thy love by the Lord, no. Yet I love thee too. I will die. I'm a moral human being. But I'm not going to die for you. Uh, uh, still, but I love you. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, again, this is Shakespeare of the comedies uh, uh, showing us there's something crazy about these highfalutin uh, romantic ideals uh, of love. And that lovers have to get beyond that. They have to understand uh, the, the realism uh, of the situation. Uh, uh, and now, uh, Rosalind has given Orlando a taste of the standard lover uh, of poetry who holds off from the man. Uh, and says, let, let me show you a different kind of woman. Uh, this is page 77. Uh, line 105, by this hand it will not kill a fly, but, but come now, I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition, uh, and ask me what you will, I will grant it, and love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith I will, Fridays and Saturdays and all, and wilt thou have me? 
I and 20 such. <laughs> what sayst thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? Uh, now this is the complete opposite of the uh, Petrarchan mistress. She comes on to the man. She wants to have sex Fridays, Saturdays and all. If one man is good, 20 or even better. Uh, 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 we realize uh, Orlando is in the grip of these Petrarchan assumptions about love. He cannot come to terms with a flesh and blood woman. It's why he balks when, when uh, 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 Rosalind comes on to him initially. Uh, he wants a woman who's a kind of poetic abstraction. And the idea that the woman should reciprocate the love is too much for him, and especially the idea that she should reciprocate it out of her own sexuality. Uh, he's, he, he's having a really hard time dealing with a flesh and blood woman because he's living in a world of poetic abstractions. And so much of this is devoted uh, to teaching him what he needs to learn about love. And again, notice always in a playful situation where this is not Rosaline there, uh, it's Ganymede. Of course, it is Rosaline, but he doesn't know that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and now she comes to another point he's got to learn, namely, what is marriage? Uh, and, and this is the curious thing about this Petrarchan love tradition. So much about love, nothing about marriage. Uh, the moment of love is infinitely prolonged, especially when the beloved dies, uh, as with Dante and Petrarch. Uh, you realize these, these, these characters are in love with love. They're not in love with a woman. They're in love with the experience of love. We will see this in Duke Orsino uh, in Twelfth Night. It's the deepest problem with Petrarchan love that Shakespeare sees it, uh, that it's in love with a certain pose, a certain attitude, uh, the wonderful feeling of misery, uh, of being a lover in misery, uh, and no thought to where it might be ha headed. So uh, now, page 78, Act 4, Scene 1, line 176, 136, Rosalind says, Now tell me how long you would have her after you have possessed her. Forever and a day. And, and there it is again. Uh, love poetry. How long we will be together forever day. And Rosalind says, and again, in such prose, say a day without the ever. <laughs> you know, we're going to take this thing day by day because that's what marriage is. Uh, it ain't love forever. Uh, no, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes them when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing like Diane in the fountain. And I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. And of course, that's the literal truth uh, there. And again, this is the stuff that the Petrarchan love poetry never confronts. What is a real marriage? Uh, it is a union of man and woman, and it's a moment that's going to involve a lot of compromise, a lot of give and take. Uh, uh, it's interesting, there are uh, feminists criticizing this play uh, uh, who criticize the marriage at the end as a resolution and, and say it means Rosalind giving up everything to step into the role of a conventional housewife. You've got an essay to that effect in the back of your book. Uh, uh, I forget which one it is, but, but they forget this passage. <laughs> when Rosalind tells Orlando he's not going to be in full control of this marriage, and indeed, from what we see of Rosalind and Orlando, it's very easy to determine who's going to wear the pants in this family when they're married. She is just so much smarter, smarter than he is. Uh, uh, I mean, she's controlling him. She's manipulating him here. I think it's implausible to think that she couldn't continue to be top gun in marriage. Uh, but the point is here that this is going to be opposites 
uh, uniting, man and woman, and there's going to be friction, and there's going to be problems, uh, and that's what you have to accept now. You better uh, realize that now. Uh, is again, the, the love poetry never tells you about this. And again, I can't stress enough the separation between love and marriage in the Petrarchan poetic tradition, so much so that, again, Edmund Spencer created a sensation when he wrote love poems uh, to his to his own wife and celebrating married love. Uh, and so page 79, I foresee one line, uh, 179, uh, 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 she checks his watch. Uh, 177, two o'clock is your hour? I, sweet Rosin, by my troth and in good earnest, and so God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise and the most hollow lover. And it's very strange here, the emphasis on punctuality as the ultimate virtue and lover. Uh, I never quite understood it until I read an essay by a woman about the play, Mira Flaumenhoff, a wonderful essay on the play, and she explained it, uh, uh, that, that this is the ultimate test of uh, Orlando for Rosalind, whether he will accommodate to her schedule. Uh, uh, and it doesn't, will he meet her halfway in this marriage? And it is true, you know, you've got these, again, these great Petrarchan lovers, oh, you mean life to me, I would die for you. And then she says, uh, will you help me with the children on Wednesday? I said, oh no, I got bowling that night, bowling with my friends. Uh, uh, I got to go out with Mercutio. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what Rosalind wants to avoid here. Uh, it's, it, it's, you wouldn't think punctuality is a, is a test, but it is. Uh, it shows, will you now accommodate your life to mine? Uh, and he has to prove that it's so much so that it's, it's only you know, a lion that stops him from showing up in time, and he's sure to send word uh, uh, about it. Uh, so this is what uh, works uh, so that... Uh, Rosalind puts Orlando through his paces, tries to strip him of his illusions about love, his phony romantic inventions, uh, and to prepare him for real marriage. Now, as a result, everything gets resolved uh, in the play. At the beginning of the play, uh, it seems like Rosalind and Orlando won't get together, Silvius and Phoebe won't get together, things are just going uh, uh, crazy, but uh, everything gets solved, this is on page 93, uh, when uh, 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 suddenly it's revealed that Ganymede is Rosalind. Uh, she's set up a riddle for them, uh, this is absolutely brilliant, uh, uh, and then resolves it all uh, uh, on page 94. Uh, when, and she's, uh, uh, this is page uh, uh, 94, I, uh, this is Act 5, Scene 2, about line 110. I will help you if I can to Phoebe. I would love you if I could tomorrow meet we all together to Phoebe. I will marry you if ever I marry a woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. That's true. To Orlando, I will satisfy if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. To Sylvius, I will content you with what pleases you, contents you, and you shall be tomorrow married tomorrow. That's all riddling here, but of course it's all resolved when you realize that, uh, that Ganymede uh, is really Rosalind. Uh, uh, and so the, the play ends with a multiple uh, marriage, bringing everybody back together. Uh, now Shakespeare very quickly solves uh, the few remaining nasty problems uh, on page uh, 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 86, this is Act 4, Scene 3, the evil older brother, Oliver, uh, converts. Uh, he's uh, saved uh, by, by Orlando and so now gives up his hatred of Orlando. This is Act 4, Scene 3, Line 136. Was it you that did so oft contrive to kill him, Orlando? Twas I, but tis not I. Uh, I do not shame to tell you what I was since my conversion so sweetly taste, being the thing I am. This is the moment of comedy. Uh, the giving up of the fixed identity. This is what the tragic figure is unwilling to do. Uh, 
uh, Oliver said, "'Twas I, but tis not I." That is what tragic figures in Shakespeare will not say. Uh, uh, they stick to the I. Uh, they stick to their original identity. That's their integrity. This is that flexibility or pliancy, the comic figure, or figures in a comedy that I was talking about. I do not shame to tell you what I was since my conversion so sweetly tastes. This is what uh, comedies, characters in a comedy have to do. They have to convert. Uh, they have to change their stripes uh, to give up whatever was standing in the way of the happy resolution. Uh, it's very interesting that the language is the language of conversion. Uh, uh, we see this uh, with uh, 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 Duke Frederick as well. Oliver was creating problems. Frederick was creating problems. We're going to play now on page 102. Uh, Act 5, scene 4, about line uh, 159. Uh, uh, he was leading an army to wipe out his older brother into the skirts. This is why I would have came. Where meeting with an old religious man after some question with him was converted both from his enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished uh, brother. It's interesting, the language in both cases is conversion. Both Frederick and uh, Oliver are willing to convert. They don't stick to their guys. Uh, and so a comic resolution uh, becomes possible here. Uh, on page 90, we see one last case of uh, love at first sight. This is Act uh, 5, Scene 2. <laughs> Orlando says to his older brother, Is it possible that on so little acquaintance you should like her, that but seeing you should love her, and loving woo, and wooing she should grant? <laughs> How is this all happening? Neither call the giddiness of in question, the poverty of her, the small acquaintance, my sudden wooing, nor a sudden count, but say with me, I love Aliana. <clears throat> so uh, Shakespeare is wrapping things up here uh, and preparing for a big finish with four marriages this time. Uh, he managed three in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Now he gets four because we're going to throw in Touchstone uh, and Audrey. And even the goddess of marriage herself, Hymen, shows up on page 101. Uh, blessing this marriage. This is Act 5, Scene 4, about line 41. And we learn, Wedding is great Juno's crown, O blessed bond of board and bed, Tis Hymen peoples every town, High wedlock then be honored. Uh, Marriage peoples the town. This is the political function of all this eros. This force which can be so divisive as we've seen and can set people at each other's throat, it can also bring them together, create new bonds in society, and produce the next generation. Uh, uh, a city without eros cannot last. Uh, and that's why Eros is so important uh, in a, a political sense. Uh, and so we see this amazing convergence of the plot at the end, uh, uh, typical of the comedy that everybody's brought together. Uh, uh, four of the couples brought together in marriage, but in general we see a refounding of a community here, a uh, uh, community which was divided in so many different ways, uh, at the beginning, now has a new foundation, and we want to say has gotten more in touch with nature. Uh, that at the beginning of the play, there's a sense that the conventions of this community have gotten out of whack with nature. That unjust things are happening, unnatural things are happening, brother against brother, uh, father against daughter. These are all, we would say, unnatural uh, things, and people are locked uh, into all sorts of uh, sterile and stultifying conventions. And so get them out in nature, shake them up, let them reorder their lives, find a form of love, for example, that's more natural. Uh, this Petrarchan love is unnatural, it's sterile, it does not lead anywhere. Uh, by injecting some prose into the situation, uh, Rosalind makes it possible for her and Orlando to move forward towards consummating uh, a love relation towards getting physical, but it's not a simple break with all convention. Uh, because, for example, they do get married. Uh, 
Uh, and for example, they need language. They need language to communicate. This is not some kind of wordless, dreamlike love such as uh, 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 Bottom had uh, with Titania. Uh, there is this notion that uh, uh, the conventions have to be refounded. They must be brought closer to nature. But you don't do away with convention, and indeed you go back to the community. You don't stay in the forest. Uh, staying in the forest would just be Touchstone and Audrey living in Baudry. Uh, uh, Shakespeare has a sense that we human beings are animals, but we're not mere animals. Uh, there's a strong animal component to sexuality. It, it is like the birds and bees doing it, as Touchstone <laughs> suggests, but it's not just that. If you try to forget that, the animal component, the love becomes impractical and sterile and goes nowhere. It becomes this farce of Petrarchan love, which is all words and no action. Uh, but it can't, you can't let it become all action and no words. There's got to be some poetry to love, even if it's a kind of poetry of prose, uh, as Orlando uh, and uh, 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 Rosalind develop. Uh, in other words, there, there is something uplifting about their love. They raise each other to greater heights, but it, again, it also is physical. So, we do have to see a community reconstituted at the end of the play. Man's life, his nature is to be found in civilization. Now, there's one exception to that, uh, and that's Jacobs. He will not join in the fun uh, at the end. Uh, as he himself says, uh, 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 on 103, uh, uh, he's, uh, this is Act 5, Scene 4, about uh, the, uh, about line 180, uh, uh, Jacobs announces, Sir, by your patience, I, if I heard you rightly, the Duke had put on a religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. Now again, this is a reminder that there is a dimension to life beyond politics, beyond the court. And interestingly, here it is religion, because we've often seen religion take that role as something that's uh, equally legitimate, uh, certainly a counterweight to political goals. And Jacobs is interested in his second brother. He, yeah, to him, I will, out of these convertites, there is much matter to be heard and learned. So he doesn't want to join the fund. And specifically, he says, line 193, I am for other than for dancing measures. And this play will end with a dance, as Midsummer Night's Dream does. A dance which, as in John Ford's movies, is Shakespeare's symbol for the constitution of a community, uh, of bringing people together. Uh, uh, and Jacobs won't join in. This is what I call tragic relief. Uh, you must have all heard of the term comic relief. It's standard in Shakespeare's tragedies. It often has a moment of comedy, which we call comic relief. We'll see this in King Lear. It is one of the signs that Shakespeare moves evenly between the worlds of tragedy and comedy, uh, that when he gives us tragedy, he wants to remind us there's a comic dimension to life as well. I'd just like to suggest here that when he gives us comedy, he also likes to remind us there's a tragic dimension to life. And we see that here with Jacobs. Yes, everyone's joined the party. Everyone's joined the dance. But Shakespeare reminds us not everybody. Uh, there's one guy who won't play uh, along. And Jacobs is a potentially tragic figure. I'm not, I'm not saying he's a tragic figure. In his own way, he's a bit of a fool. But it just shows you, yeah, the, the, everyone's seeing the same. Everyone's brought together. But there's one guy who doesn't see things the same way. Now, Jacobs is particularly interesting uh, because he illustrates, I think, an important point about the play. Uh, I talked about role playing and the importance of... Uh, uh, Rosalind being able to act uh, and be detached uh, from conventional roles in life to accomplish all these things she do she does, but she returns to a conventional role at the end. She's willing to become a woman again because <laughs> she is a woman uh, and to become a wife uh, and to resume her place in the community. The role playing is temporary in this play as it is in Shakespeare's comedies. These are games. This is playtime. This is exhibition season. Uh, uh, it is the function of these uh, role-playing moments to be temporary. They're there to allow society to reorder, but to allow it to reorder when people readopt 
uh, some kind of social role. Uh, now, there are many uh, uh, critics of the play today, postmodern critics, who see this as bad, uh, that it's awful that Shakespeare uh, has the characters readopt uh, uh, social roles and that really what the play should teach, or maybe at some deeper level, unconscious level, teaches that, this, that it's all role playing. Uh, uh, that there's no uh, real identity, for example, there's no fixed sexual identity, it's just that people are playing roles. Now it happens that there's someone in the play who articulates this view, and it's Jacobs. This is page 43, Act 2, Scene 7, about line 139. In fact, the most famous lines in the play, and among the most famous lines in Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. And this speech is often lifted out of context and offered to Shakespeare's deepest wisdom. And isn't this, doesn't this sound great, all the world's a stage? But let me speak some more of the speech here. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy with a satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school, and then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow, then a soldier full of strange oaths and beard like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick and quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice and fair round belly with good cape and line, with eyes severe and beard and formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble, pipes and whistles in a sound last seen of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. This is a disgusting, repellent vision of human life. And I truly believe it is not Shakespeare's <laughs> vision of human life. And if you want to see why, look at the stage direction, enter Orlando with Adam. Jacobs has just been describing old age as sans teeth, sans eyes, sans thing. We have seen Adam come close to starving, but accompany his master, Adam, who's 80 years old. Uh, 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 the Shakespeare, you can't take words and speeches alone, Shakespeare. You've got to look at the action here. And Shakespeare deliberately has the action contradict the words here. And we see, in fact, the danger of thinking of life as merely role-playing. And what people have pointed out about this speech, it's a deeply nihilistic speech, it sees life as meaningless because it leaves out just about everything that gives life meaning, and above all, marriage and children. Uh, this is the seven ages of man. There's nothing about uh, uh, getting married. There's nothing about having children. There's nothing about having children to help you in your old age, and so on. So in fact, Shakespeare includes within the play the notion that life is merely role-playing in order to criticize it. And please notice that half the characters in the play criticize Jacobs. Jacobs represents a cynical, detached view of life uh, that can be very funny, very amusing, but that in some ways misses the heart of life. It misses what the other characters participate in, the joys of love and the joys of marriage. So this is a comedy, and it celebrates marriage, the continuity of human life, uh, the continuity of the community through the family. Now, we'll see Shakespeare takes a very different view of these matters in his tragedies, but this is what defines the comic view here. And Jacobs remains the outsider, uh, the voice of lonely and, quite frankly, unhappy critique here. Okay, I'm out of time. I didn't get to some stuff I want to deal with, but we will, we will turn to Twelfth Night uh, next time and round out our view of Shakespearean romantic comedy.